if we do not start feeling from each other, feeling each other's pain, Nazi Germany is the future of mankind. This is all brain, power, nuclear weapons, no heart. How can you have this society burning children? Can you tell us, please, what was the worst thing that happened to you in a concentration camp? The worst thing that uh, was that I saw my grandparents and my uncles that I love dearly, they were very, very, I was very close to my grandparents, very, very close, being put on a train and sent to Treblinka to die. That was the most difficult time, and I was only five years old. March 1943. What did you feel at that moment when you saw this train leaving? The feeling of being helpless, that there is nothing we can do. It was my grandmother I was very close to. In the concentration camp, they gave us food only once a day, and it was a bean soup, mostly water with very few beans. And I was a little child, I was crying, I was hungry. So she would give me her portions and saying, I'm going to die anyway, I'm old, have it for you. She gave me all her portions, she did not eat. So that woman, that grandmother of mine, disappeared from my life, helplessness. I think that is the only story I have. And the fear that the people that I love will disappear. As I know, there was a case that a fascist had hit you with a rifle buttstock. Why he did it? Well, as I said, I was hungry because the service one meal a day, just some bean soup that we had to wait for an hour to get it. And he built a little fountain there and they had golden fish in it. And I was five years old, so I believed that if I can go and I catch one of these golden fish, I can maybe eat it. And I was hungry, so I went to the, gold, to the fountain, tried to catch a fish. It was Bulgarian fascist, and he just hit me with a rifle in my face, and I became cross-eyed, and because I could not correct my cross-eyed during the war, I lost my sight on my left eye. I don't see on my left eye. At which point of time did you feel closest to death in the concentration camp? The consul of Spain discovered this Jewish community in Kosovo and he discovered that those people speak old Spanish. So he could give us passports. But when we were in a concentration camp, the Bulgarian fascist said, anybody with a foreign passport, give it to us to check. My father says, I don't trust them. I will not give them the passport. So 11 families gave the passport, never saw the passport again, and they all perished in Treblinka. My family was allowed to leave because we had a Spanish passport. And we escaped over the mountains to Albania, where we hid among the Muslims. We were hiding there in the mountains, no water, no running water, no electricity for sure. A very primitive life. I watched the road through this window to see if the German army would stop or keep moving waiting for freedom. There, where you can see a cow and a person walking, we saw this place through the window. And when the shooting started, we would lie down on the floor to avoid getting hit. When my father acted, which he was not, he was dyslexic, he could not read and write, but he was very smart and he decided that he's going to pose as if he's a doctor to take care of the primitive people. And that's how we survived. But he did not like 40 days of Ramadan not to eat. He told me to go to the second floor where those Albanians were living and to be sure that to listen if I can hear my father and my mother eating. And if they do, I should jump on the wooden floor to let them know you can be heard. And he told me, if you don't jump on time and they hear us eating, they will cut our head off. They will kill us. So our life depends on you. Six years old. For 40 days, I was scared if I'm going to miss giving a signal that they can be heard eating. One day I snapped. 
I slept. I was out in the field in front of the house and I think I saw a German soldier. And I was sure they're coming to kill us. And I fainted. And my mother says that for 40 days I was in coma. From time to time I would come out of coma, eat, and then go back to coma screaming and screaming and screaming that I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. How did it happen that you, being a child who had to go through such difficulties, you became a person who invented the most popular integration technology and methodology? Number one is, I'm Jewish, but in the Second World War, we paraded as Muslims. So I was a Muslim for two years. Then when I came to United States, I was put with a Catholic family. So I was a Catholic for a month. And all at once I started realizing, wait a moment. God is one for all of us. What is the difference? The difference is in the manual. We are all the same. We are all people. I had that experience in the Second World War. In the, it's in my book. One day I saw the Albanians running with and you know, and with guns and running to the street, to the road. So I ran like a little child after them. And I saw a German soldier, and he was 12. He in a German uniform, scared to death that they're going to kill him. And I was in a, in a Muslim uniform. I scared for my death, for my life. He scared for his life. His, our eyes connected, and I felt sorry for him. I think they killed him. And I made a commitment, I'm going to do something about it. So in the 1958, the first group of German kids came to Israel to establish a relationship between Germany and Israel. And they asked who wants to volunteer to lead them. I stepped forward, I will lead them. In honor of that, of that little kid, I have experience to realize that the boundaries are not there. As I travel the world, I see people are the same. And the corona disease that we have now, pandemic, is a signal. Get together or you're going to die. Air, water, smoke, disease, microbes do not know borders. And unless we stop these borders and start thinking as one humanity, we are going to continue disappearing from the, first, from the face of this earth. We all need to start learning how to integrate. Change these integrates. Everything will fall apart. Unless we develop the heart. Nazi Germany in the history of mankind. It was a preamble, a warning. A society, highly educated, no heart. How can you have this society burning children if we do not start feeling for each other, feeling each other's pain, Nazi Germany is the future of mankind. This is all brain, power, nuclear weapons, no heart. The future company that's going to be successful is the one that loves, that loves the client. Steve Jobs loved the computer. The computer, Apple computer, the best computer, the most client-oriented, serve them as the clients. That's why it was successful. What is love? Absolute integration. So I'm teaching integration, but I don't talk about love. Because if you tell people, I'm here to promote love, they say, this guy is a crazy guy, forget him. I talk about integration. But what is behind it really is love. You have left the concentration camp. Then you lived in Albanian village. Then you went to school. Why did children throw stones at you? Because I was a foreigner. I did not speak the language. I was very thin. I had swollen, swollen whatever it's called when you're very hungry. I was, I was, I was very, very hungry. And I was Jewish. Kids can be very, very cruel when somebody is not one of them, when it looks different. The person that was the most cruel to me, his name was Chira. My, uh, the teacher at that time saw that he was beating me up and treating me badly and kicking me. He called both of us in front of the class 
and he asked the class, look at both of them. Don't they look like brothers? Are we not all brothers? How are they different? They're not different. And then he put us to sit at the same table next to each other. The one that was my biggest enemy. And we became the best friends. This experience that somebody who looks like an enemy can be a friend repeated itself 50 years after the war. Interesting to tell, tell, share this story. Uh, as I was trying to open my heart, I tried everything possible, psychotherapy. I, I tried everything until nothing worked. Until somebody told me there is a shaman from Peru whom I can help me. So I met the shaman. He looked at me and he said, your fear, your biggest fear is you're going to die, right? And wow, he hit, he hit it on the head. That permeated 70 years of my life. And then he said, you are feared to death. You have to accept death to be able to live. I will help you. You have to experience death. Experience death. Wow, I'm so scared of death. I'm going to experience death. He says, don't worry, I'll take care of you. So I trusted him, I was so desperate. I was so desperate to get rid of my trauma of the Second World War that I said, I will do it. And we went to my yacht, I had a yacht, and he gave me an injection that they give in mental hospitals to people when they are out of control and they're very powerful when they're out of control, madmen. And they totally paralyzes them, total paralysis. So he put me in bed and he told me, when you come out of the injection, you will know what life is all about. I could not see anything. I could not move an, an eyelid, nothing, 100% paralysis. And then something very strange happened. I could feel. First time in my life, I could feel. And then I realized what is life and death, all, what is hell and heaven all about. Hell is you die. It's not a physical life. It's an emotional life. I realize when you die and they're burying you and people that are around your coffin hate you for what you have done to them and you cannot leave because you cannot say, I'm sorry, let me explain to you what happened. There was a reason why I did that. Uh, let me give an explanation. You cannot do that. You're dead. And then when I came out of that experience, I was crying. I was weeping as a matter of fact. And I said, now I know what life is about, to love. So before you die, how much love have you left behind? That's what life is all about, to love. And that I made it now myself as a mantra, to love, without depending, and to live without pretending, and to listen without defending, and to speak without offending. This is my mantra which I got out of that experience. Dr. Adizis, is it true that your father in your childhood was really tough? He could smite you or offend you? I had a very difficult father. A poor guy, I understand him. He was dyslexic at that time. He could not read write. He was kicked out of school at the fourth grade elementary school. And everybody treated him like retarded, but he was not retarded. He was extremely smart. He, I mean, he saved us during the Second World War. He, he always knew to find his way to feed the family. <laughs> Dyslexic people are very smart, but at that time they didn't know it. So he always felt disrespected, shamed, so guess who had to pay the price? Me. So he was tough on me. All his pain passed on to me.
you wrote more than 15 bestsellers, and if we are going to be watched by people who never read any of your books, which three of your books would you recommend to a person who never read them? Book number one, book number two, and book number three. The ideal executive, the other one is called mastering change. How to manage change, how do you manage change? And the third one, which is a Bible, is called Managing Corporate Life Cycles. Why organizations grow, age and die, and what to do about it. So these are my three Bibles. Ideal boss. This is a classification of the management style, and it's interesting to find out what is your uh, style of management, a producer, administrator, entrepreneur, or integrator. I am a combination which is very difficult. I'm an E and an A. I'm creative, big ideas and a big vision, and at the same time, attention to details. That's not the usual style. I'm an EA. But that's the secret of my success because I don't remain with big words and big ideas. I take the ideas and I work very, very, very hard to put them into details manual, how to make it work. I'm not an easy guy to work with because I want to change the world and I want to do everything correctly. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't work very easily. I'm weak on P and I'm weak on I. So that's what my style is. Very seldom combination EA, and they are very contradictory to each other. Your close people, they, you are tough on them sometimes. For example, in the family. Yeah, I'm not easy to work with, I agree. I want everything but correctly, so that makes it very difficult to be with. But how this is shown in your personal life. I know your first life, when she left you, she said that you do not understand women. It's because of these management styles. I still don't. I still don't understand women. <laughs> but you know, they, because they are very... They're different. They think differently. Feminine energy is AI energy. Masculine energy is PE. Some women are PEs. So it's very difficult to really make sense out of this. But the way I handle it is my second wife better than my first wife. When I get upset with her, what's wrong with her, I sit down and I write down what's wrong with me. And then I said, you know what, if she can accept me, I can accept her. End of the story. <laughs> In one of your books, you said a phrase which really touched me. Train love as if it's a muscle. But which specific exercises do you know to train the love? Love is when you do something for somebody that needs it, and you do not expect anything in return. In my religion, in my culture, Sephardi culture, we have an expression. God help me not to expect from my children. If you do things for your children, then you expect them to pay you back. You're ready for a big surprise and disappointment in life. Love is to be experienced, to be practiced, not to be talked and spoken about and write about and sing about. What have you done for others that you don't expect anything back? What can I do for you? Look, like you do with your children. I don't know whether you have children. When you take them to this, to the circus, and you write down, I took you to the circus today, 29th of, of April 2021, you owe me something when I'm old, God forbid. Why did you take them to the circus? Because as they're giggling and laughing and so happy, you're happy. That is love. Love is not give and take. In the giving is a taking. It's simultaneous. Your happiness is my happiness. I know that you have six kids. All these kids are yours. Three are my biological, three I adopted with my second wife. In one of your interviews, you said that the main thing that you feel sorry that you didn't give a lot of attention to your kids. Which are the main recommendations in family integration on the basis of your methodology? Like one of my clients told me, made me almost cry for him. He says, you know, Dr. Adizes, all I remember about my children is when they were born and when they got married. In between, I don't remember anything. Like that didn't exist. You have to make a decision. What is your constraint goal you're not going to violate? Like, 
I recommend to my clients on the weekend, take your children. How many children do you have? Don't take them all together. No, no, no. One at a time. This is your Sunday. No, this is your Sunday. This is your Sunday. What do you want to do? One on one. It's called quality time. And with your wife, have one evening. Test. You decide. One evening a month, one week in a week, whatever. You decide. A goal. I'm going to take her out to dinner to a nice restaurant. Just she and me alone. Not with friends. Just the two of us alone. They have achieved big results in their lives. One is a well-known film director, another is a musician. The third one was managing your academy, which lessons you were able to take from how you was educated by your father. And now you have applied it to bringing up your kids. Both my mother and my father had a rule. If you are happy, we are happy. So what makes you happy? As long as it's legal and it does not hurt your health, go do it. So I never stopped my children to do what they wanted to do. When my son said, I want to be a movie director, I said, oh my God, are you crazy? A movie director, I mean, you know, one out of millions succeed, you're going to fail, you know, don't go there. He says, but that is my passion, father. So if it's your passion, go do it. I'll be calling my mom, she'll be shocked. I have an amazing team here, and I just want to thank them, but I just also really want to thank the participants who opened their hearts up to us. Same thing with my son, the compositor, the musician. Music industry, especially in California, is a... Keep away from it if you can. He says, but Dad, if I don't do it, I, I, I would rather die. I said, okay, do it. Do your passion. So my message is, let your children live their passion. And I tell the same thing to my children. Do what you love, then you will never work. That's why I cannot retire. For me to retire is a punishment. What will I do if I retire? Tell a painter, stop painting, go retire. Many successful people has gone through a lot of great suffering to become who they are now. And when we become parents, we try to protect our children from hardships and problems. Don't you think that such parents deprive their children of the opportunity to become great? Okay, there is a story. The butterfly first is in a cocoon, right? Then it gets out of the cocoon and becomes a butterfly, right? And the story is about a guy watching a butterfly struggling to get out of the cocoon. And he tried to help her. The butterfly died, could not fly. What happened? Struggling in young age, you're developing the muscle to handle the old age later on. If you protect your children from problems, they will be like the butterfly who never learned to fly. And when they have a problem, they're going to collapse. One of my people that works for me, I'm very impressed with him. Very, 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 very impressed. And I told his father, he should write a book, How to Be a Parent. He really should write a book because he raised a child he works for me, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with this guy. Impressed, why? He's always on time, always gives you feedback, works hard, available, never afraid to speak up, respectfully. Wow, how did you raise this? He's only 23 years old. How did your father raise you to be like this? What is the secret? He says, my father never gave me an allowance which we always give the children an allowance, right? No. Very early age, and the father told him, as long as you're under my roof, my rules of the family, do what I tell you. You're under my roof, I feed you my roof. The moment you leave the house, you're on your own. Don't ask for any help, because I will not give you. This guy grew up strong. Don't protect your children too much. Protect them from going on drugs, becoming alcoholic, being with the wrong, with a gang, yes. But normal, let them struggle, let them develop, let them be, develop their muscle, or they will be always dependent on you.
I started working at the age of 11, selling newspapers on the street. So I was bringing food to the house. I was feeding the house, my family at the age of 11. I came to America with $50 in my pocket. My father did not give me one cent. $50 and an accordion. I slept the first night in America, in New York, in the back seat of a car that somebody let me use. I did it all by my own hands. Thanks to my father, thanks to my father. And he told me, when I die, I will give you nothing. There's going to be no inheritance. Build your own. Mother, what do you want to know about Ichak? He became a famous professor, the most famous in the world. Look at him now, he's like a king mother. Dr. Adizis, due to the fact that we are making interview for internet environment, there is a chance that this video in 100 years will be viewed by your great-grandsons. Let's imagine that something like this would happen. Which advice would you give to your great-great-grandchildren? Which advice would you give them from now? If I just tell you the words, they look too superficial. So let me give you the base of it. When the Big Bang happened and the universe was created, what happened? Time and space started. If time and space started with the Big Bang, which means before the Big Bang, there was something that was not limited by time and space. What is not limited by time and space? Energy. There was energy. That energy can be constructive or it can be destructive. What makes it constructive? If there is synergy, together we grow. And if there is symbiosis, if we benefit by being together. What is God? God is not a father in heaven looking down. You're a bad boy, you will be punished. You're a good boy, you will be rewarded. God is an algorithm, is a formula that says, if you have mutual trust and respect, there will be synergy and symbiosis, the energy will be constructive, and you will build something. When there is no mutual trust and respect, there is no synergy, there is no symbiosis, the energy is destructive, the country falls apart, there is no more Yugoslavia, there is no more Soviet Union, and if America continues the way it's going to be, there's going to be no more America, we are falling apart here. There is no mutual trust and respect. So what I will tell my grandchildren is, anything that causes you to lose respect for yourself or to respect other people is forbidden. Anything that makes you not trust yourself or not trust others, get out. Follow God's will. God's will is honor each other's difference and share the benefits of what you create together. That is a secret. That is my message. I know that you have been working with Sberbank, which in the last 10 years have big transformation where old ladies were queuing and it became progressive IT company and you know German Graf. Can you list specific recommendations that you gave him when you've been communicating with him? Herman Graf gives me a lot of credit. We work with, and by the way, look at the ads, all about love. I, I admire Graf a lot. I think Graf is one of the best executives and a human being I've met in my 50 years of experience. For me, he is first and foremost an example of person with absolutely inexhaustible energy and a very well-structured mindset. So, it's the combination of his wisdom, very clear thinking and huge personal energy. This is not something you encounter in the market often. Before I work with Sparebank, I work with Bank of America, so you have to understand where I'm coming from. And when I ask what is Bank of America about, they take savings on which they pay interest, give loans on which you charge interest, and the difference is the profit of the bank. And then in 1982, I already realized, hey guys, the banking industry is dead. There is competition on both sides, on demand and supply. 
you don't need to take a loan from a bank. You can take a loan from private equity funds, from investors, stock market. And the Bank of America, I told them, guys, we need to move away from being a bank to be, to be a financial services company. We give you advice as a private bank for fee. We, give you, we manage your trust for fee, fee-based. So when I came to Spare Bank, one of the advisors I said is, how do you get beyond being a bank? Beyond being a bank. How can you diversify what you do? And then I worked with them on the structure. What you have to do what Alibaba is doing. Alibaba is a payment system. Now that you, I have you as my client on the payment system, and you're using money to pay, you can pay many things. Why don't we use the channel to sell you everything? Furniture, food, cars, anything that's Alibaba system around the payment system. So now a bank is not a financial services, it's becoming a big sales channel that is competing with Amazon. Forget Amazon now. The future is really Alibaba's model. It's called super app, superior application, totally beyond. So the idea is change. Have you changed at all the last three years, Pavel, in your advertising agency? What percentage of your revenue comes from products or services you did not have three years ago? At least 30% of your revenue should come from something that did not exist three years ago. That is the principle. At least 30%. Former CEO of Bank of America said that the Adizis methodology has improved internal communications by encouraging team management habits. Can you list three main signs of a company with big internal integration problems? Everything is a system. And a company is a system. A system is composed by definition, by subsystems. So you have the marketing subsystem, you have the sales subsystem, production subsystem, financial subsystem, human capital subsystem. Marketing changes faster than sales. Marketing, marketing campaign, done. To change sales effort, to retrain the salesman and to retrain the customer to the new sale, it takes a little bit longer. How much longer does it take to change production? Oh my God. And how long does it take to change accounting? You should live long enough. And how long does it take to change the human capital? Attitudes of people, culture of people. Wow. That creates gaps in the system because they don't advance in the same speed. It creates disintegration. Change causes disintegration. Marketing says we do this, sales is not ready yet. And because of that, they're not working together. Production says, what the hell are you doing? I mean, you're already selling something we cannot deliver. That's what happened to Tesla. He was selling faster than he could produce. And he had a problem. Okay, or we are selling faster, but they don't have enough money. Oppa, we have a financial problem, not enough working capital. Or we have the money, we have the market, we have the product, we don't have the people. The people are not ready yet. Where do we get the people? These are all signs of disintegration that the subsystems have moved faster from, the, from each other. And the idea is, here is a take on value. Don't allow anyone to go too fast than the other. Keep them aligned, alignment. I have a company that we helped go from $12 million to $4 billion. And they asked the owner, Stuart Resnick, what is your secret? He says, alignment of the subsystems. Alignment, alignment. What's called integrated growth, not disintegrating growth. Integrated growth. Always watch that they are aligned. That's also called teamwork. Of the subsystems have to work together. The people have to work together. They have to share information. They have to be open to tell the problems they have and not to be afraid which is very important for the Russian audience. Listen to me. You really have a problem in Russia, which I know from working in Russia. I'll tell you what happened. 
I was lecturing and I was using an overhead projector at that time. You write on that and it projects. By mistake, the page moved to the side. So all the people had to look at the, at the, at the screen like this. Now, if it was Israel, they would start shouting at me, hey, 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 professor, your page is on the side. In Russia, not one word. So I made a joke. I hope it's not offensive. Because I sit in meetings. My God, Russia has incredible people, incredible innovations. Some of the biggest innovations were done in Russia. The best mathematicians, the best physics, the incredible people unused because of the system, because of the culture. So I made a joke. A guy lost his brain. Went to buy brain. Tell him this brain, a famous surgeon, $400,000 for this brain. This brain, Nobel Prize winner, $500,000 for the brain. This brain, Russian executive, 1 million euros. Why? Totally new, never used. You have an incredible resource in Russia. Incredible resource. Because of the system, culture. I'm not talking communism, no, culture. You are quiet, you don't challenge. If we can only open, it will be <sighs> to teach people, yes, you can talk and not to be afraid and you're not threatening. We can work together, we can exchange information, we can tell if something is wrong so we can do something about it. To manage without fear, to manage without fear. To manage with hope. Dr. Adesis, I'm dreaming that at 83 I will have as much energy as you do. Love, 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 love. Love what you do, my friend. Love what you do. Love your family, love your children, love what you do, love the people, love my clients, love my books, love. When you just said these words, I remembered a conversation with my grandmother before she died. She was very old, she felt very bad, and we knew that she had few days left. And my mother told me, please call her, talk to her. So I have spoke with her for several minutes, and she always was a happy person. And I remembered her words, I never told them to anybody. But now you told me, and I remembered, she told me, love each other. And she repeated it several times, love each other. And perhaps this is the most important thing when people come to this discovery before the deathbed. There is a stereotype that business consultants are people who only confuse business. They provide ton of useless charts that nobody will ever use. But because you are a consultant, you have a consulting company, can you give us a specific example of specific company where your work has improved, which has positive financial results from your assistance as a consultant? First of all, I am not a consultant. But this institute is not in consulting. Unfortunately, they consider us consulting because they don't have another word. I'm into organizational therapy. I'm there to help the company solve the problems they cannot solve. We are there to integrate the company because this integration gives them all the problems. And what is integration? It's healing, to make it a whole, to make it together. But that's what the role of therapy is, to integrate, to put you together. I try to forbid to call me a consultant, because consulting is following the allopathic medicine analogy. I'm sick, you know better than me, you're the doctor, I tell you my problem, you give me the solution, and you write down the solution. In therapy, it's upside down. In consulting, you have the question, I have the answer. In therapy, I, the therapist, have the question. You, the patient, have to find the answer. You are responsible to find your problem. You are responsible to find your solution. I will only ask you the questions. So we are really not consultants. We don't write reports. We don't give recommendations. We don't have charts, you know, with tables and all that stuff. This is outdated methodology. That's why 
Million, billions of dollars are wasted on consulting. They write beautiful reports and they don't get implemented or they get implemented badly. Bad industry. I am not in that industry. Please don't put me in the same group. We are not. This is a paradigm shift in the field of managing change. We have developed and took me 50 years to develop. I started as a consultant and I wrote a beautiful report that I studied and blew, 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 and they did not implement it. And I got very upset. I said, what's wrong? You agree with me, it needs to be done, right? Yeah, we agree with your recommendation. So why don't you do it? And then I realized it's not good enough to decide. Implementation is what the problem is. And the consulting industry does not deal with implementation. They leave you there with the problem. I said, I'm going to develop a methodology that is implementation oriented. The companies that we work in, they implement. Why? Because it's their decision. It is their problem they agree to. It is their solution they agree to. And we know how to bring all the, imp all the factors necessary together to make a decision together. So nobody make, puts sticks in the wheels to stop the implementation. You see, I integrated the two. It is a different methodology. This is a different methodology. Because if you go to our website, adizes.com, you will see uh, testimonials of companies. Uh, for instance, this company for 12 million to 4 billion, the company is called Wonderful, privately owned. They own Fiji Water. I know you have it in Russia, I drank it. Fiji Water, they own the biggest farm in America. They have, I think, 60% of the pistachio market. They started with $12 million. Another company in, Sp in Mexico, I'm still working with them. We started from a capitalization of, sorry, uh, worth of 250 million. Today it's 15 billion. 15 billion. And now we are working on how to make it a $50 billion. Integrated advance. Applied material, we went from 400 million to $15 billion too. Domino Pizza from 150 million, also to 4 billion. And these are all testimonials in our website, name of the president, name of the company. So this is not hearsay. They said, thanks to Dr. Adizas. So it's not a secret. We now tell you how, how to work together. Look at this. This is a symbol of Adizas. What do you see? Four fingers together. That's why in the Middle East it's called a hamsa. It's a blessing. Go to your church, any church in Russia. Your saints are standing like this. What the hell is this? It's a blessing. Be together, different together. Different together. And what did communism, fascism, racism, and religious fanatism do? Be together the same. Death. Disintegration. What we need to learn is how to be different together in our marriage, in our company, in our country, and on the globe. Several questions from our Telegram chat. People have possibility to ask them through me, so I would like to do that. When company faces a lot of problems, how can one recognize the need to close it down and start from the scratch? When you lost hope, as long as you have hope, you can keep going. What kept the Jewish people going for 2,000 years? Other people disappeared. We still keep going. In spite of the persecution, in spite of being spread all over the world, in spite of being maimed and killed and burned and gassed, we always have hope. Every prayer, hope. So as long as you have hope, you can still keep going. The day you lose hope is finished. So one of the important things that a leader has to give to the country, to the company, a parent to the family, hope, realistic hope. We are working on it. It will be better. We are together. Tomorrow is a new day. Keep going. That's a good leader. That's a good parent. That's a good leader of a company. Hope, never lose hope. Next question from my friend. When he was young, he built a company with a revenue of almost a billion dollars. What, according to your opinion, person should remember when he is 35 to continue being happy when he is 80? The expression is, 
if you stop growing, you start dying. And it looks like one billion is not enough. He has to go to two billion and three billion and four billion and five billion. Not true, not true. You can grow two different ways. More is better or better is more. I am claiming that humanity is destroying itself because we are still working on more, 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 more economic growth, more economic growth. We are destroying the air, we are destroying the water, we are destroying the earth, we are destroying everything. More, more, more. We need to change for more is better. A better society, a better environment, a better company, a better marriage, less crime, better health. Change the orientation. Many times we confuse, we believe more is better. Not true. Some people have three cars in the garage, five houses all over the world, and two aeroplanes, and they're miserable. More is not better. Better can be more. So start thinking, what can I do to make my life better? We have only blitz questions. Money, power, or fame? If I have a choice, I will take power. Because fame can be very shallow and money goes and comes. Power can create power, power can create money, and power can create fame. Does humanity need immortality? No. God forbid. That's a big danger, by the way. We are really starting to talk about immortality, creating everything, artificial limbs, artificial heart, artificial brain, put a chip, you don't need a brain anymore, you have a chip, and connect to the the cloud, oh my God, to live forever. Just imagine the whole world living forever. No young people, no continuity. God forbid we learn how to clone people. God forbid we prevent people from dying. We need to die for new generations to be born. You said that a period from 2020 till 2025 will be remembered in history as the biggest disaster in history. Why? Where did you get this? I, I don't think I said it, but maybe somebody interpreted it this way. No, I don't think so. I think that we are at the intersection of civilization. We are now at the intersection that we are developing the brain, we are developing artificial intelligence, we are developing powerful computers. Lead wars with computers. We are not using our brain. You know, you don't use your brain anymore. You use the Siri, ask questions of the Siri, ask the cloud. You know, everything is now technology based. And that's scary to me. Because, as I said, if we don't develop the heart, we are on our way to become another Nazi Germany. That's why we are in the intersection. Intersection between Nazi Germany, Armageddon, or happiness, unity, humanity, love. That's where at that intersection. We are right there at the intersection now, at this today. And I'm worried, I think we are going to go that way. This is very difficult to develop love and understanding and integration, that's hard work. Destruction is very easy. How many people look at a house being built? How many people look at a house that's going to be demolished? Everybody is looking at the house going to be destroyed. Destruction is attractive. Building is very slow and not as attractive. So I am worried. I have a funny question from our Telegram chat. It has a uh, funny context in Russia, but also has a meaning to our conversation because we speak through this internet bridge. The question follows, Dr. Adizis, is that you? Is it truly you? There are multiple me's. I'm not alone. If you know my methodology, it's my P, my A, my E, my I. Different people. That's why I'm in argument with myself all the time. I just thought about it this morning, by the way. I just thought about it this morning. They say that happiness is a choice we make. That's true. I have a story about it that I use. A father had two sons. One was an absolute pessimist. Life is terrible. I hate my life. Everything is bad. I cannot stand it anymore. Oh, God. 
And the other one was the absolute optimist. Everything is wonderful, life is wonderful, ha, 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 ha. And he decided to make them more balanced, experientially. He took the pessimist kid, put him in a room full with all toys that a child can dream about to show him that life can be wonderful. Life is full with toys, enjoy life, play. And took the pessimist, optimist kid, put him in the room full with horse manure up to his ankles to show him that life is not always so perfect. Life is a lot of manure too. After several hours, he went to see what's going on. And the pessimist kid is sitting in the middle of the room crying out, life is miserable, I hate my life, so many toys, how am I going to choose which toy to play with? Why did you put me in this terrible situation to suffer? He went to the optimist kid and he's shoveling horse manure around, singing, whistling, laughing, happy. Says, why are you happy with so much horse manure? Says, if so much horse manure, there must be a pony around. We choose to be happy or not to be happy. It's a choice we make. Now the question I asked myself this morning, as a matter of fact, who is me making the choice? Who is this me making the choice? Why don't I make a choice to be happy? Why am I not happy most of the time? Why do I just get up in the morning and decide, from now on, I'm happy, finish. I made a choice. Who are you to make the choice? Who is this Ishakadizes who is going to make the choice? And traditionally, our final question, it's a very philosophical one. If right now you could be in my place and would be able to ask yourself any question, what would you ask of yourself? What is your biggest achievement? And what is your biggest achievement? To lose some weight. <laughs> That's the most difficult for me to do. To write books is easy. To philosophize is easy. To be successful consultant is easy. To lose one kilo, very difficult. Dr. Adizas, you are 83 years old. Personally, you've been helping to presidents of countries. You've helped thousands of companies. You've read books that have been read by millions of people. But I would like to ask you, about a gift to those people who will watch this video, the most valuable gift that you will give them, your time. 30 minute session to one of the subscribers who will give the best comment. Okay, you got it. It was a very good interview. I really appreciate, very intelligent, very to the point. So you, I'm happy to give the present. Let's make competition. What should people write in a comment so that we will be able to choose the most interesting comment? So what's going to be homework that we should give to people to write about? What do you think what the Dr. Adiza said? What do you think? What made the most sense to you? What did you take home that has value to you the most? What are you going to take with you and use? Because if not, nobody uses what I'm saying, I just wasted two hours of my time. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I know how valuable your time is. And for those people who will watch this video, in the comments under this video, you will have to write a short message, a comment with the main idea that you get from this interview or from other sources where Dr. Adizis were broadcasting his ideas. And the most interesting comment will get a unique opportunity of personal 30-minute session with Dr. Adizis. This is going to be fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Спасибо Thank you, Father. My father, when we left the village after the war, promised that he will come back to build them a well so they don't have to go all the way to the river to fetch water to bring to the house. But for 50 years, Albania was closed. 50 years after the war, the borders opened up. And I told my father, let's go back to the village and fulfill the promise you made to build them a well. And by the way, there is a movie about it. And back to the Albanian village to meet the people that we were with. And at that time, I was scared to see them. We came in 95 and we meet them and they're hugging and kissing each other, big love affair. I said, wait a moment, this is the enemy. Oh, where is this love coming from? Director of the documentary film asked these Albanians, did you know that he was a doctor? And the guy says, 
he was not a doctor. We knew it, but we did not want him to lose face. So we let him act like a doctor and we fed him anyway. Then he asked them, did you know that they, are, that they, are, that they were Jewish? He said, oh, we knew it all the time they were Jewish. Let us be and save our life. The one that they thought is the enemy. Here it is. He's not an enemy.